Today's participants are Bob Hoekstra, Tony Grisafi. We joined a conversation in the faculty lounge. If, if there is a global village, I mean, how is it really looking? What is it going to look like, or what does it look like? Where will it go? What are its principles? And those are things that we that we yeah. also take a look at. What is at its well. culture when it's coming it, from it, so it, many different cultures. cultures. Exactly. How does it how does it amalgamate a culture? Exactly. And that's a good that's a really good point that you just raised that the concept of text is very Western European centered. Um, and that's been in some ways in terms of English, that's been a part of the discourse of it anyway. Um, for instance, post structural theory, uh, which is which after structuralism, if you take a look at people such as Roland Barthes to, to Michel Foucault. Uh, working in that particular field, in some ways, that's what they're that's what they're really looking at and critiquing the notion that uh, a text uh, is something grounded in this particular view, worldview, Western European sort of society. Um, and then when you get into people such as you know Jacques Derrida, who looks at deconstruction of texts, I mean his whole theory is that we need to take a look at how these texts are both constructed within these cultures. Uh, how they also then marginalize other voices, uh, either within or outside of our cultures. So, for instance, again, Western Europeans talk to Western Europeans and tend not to talk to uh, other cultures. Now, post-structural and post-modern theory and deconstructive theory talks about, well, here are these other cultures, here are their voices, and this is where they also belong in this discussion as well. So all of that is contained within the, the, the idea of text and technology in terms of this digital environment, because that's part of, part of the other issue here. We're talking to people across cultural divides, and how then does this technology bring people together uh, from these from these differences to or, be able to or break them apart? Right. I, I mean, just the 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 awful images that I've chosen not to go go right. look at, but Absolutely. but some of the things that are happening in Iraq are specifically there to cause that divide, right. and that's all part of that digital media as well. Oh, exactly. Um, one of the things that I did as a project was to take a look at. Um, I don't know what you might call them dangerous online communities, and I did a study on white supremacists um, and, and to look at how they, by the by the almost the beginning of the 90s, the white supremacist movement in America had really began to die. Uh, you started getting them splintered off into militia groups, and you know they just really weren't doing that well, and, and you know, they probably never would have gone away, but they didn't have a whole lot of impact. Well, comes the internet, um, and you know. This one, the one white supremacist website called Stormfront.org goes up, uh, and you know at this moment in time, Stormfront.org has had already something like eight million hits since it's been on, uh, and since it's it was the first one to go up online. But since its advent, there's also now been something like five thousand of these groups worldwide that have found a home on the internet. Um, it seems trivial in some ways because we know that their ideology is real extreme and nobody really thinks about you know that anyway, but. The point, though, is that what happened was that the internet and that ability created a, a space for this marginalized voice to find and a legitimacy a home. and a legitimacy exactly. And my student, the story of my student, shows that uh, that she couldn't even discern the difference between this this white supremacist website that she found and every other website as well. And it did; it created on, an, an online legitimacy, and it made the community in some ways even more active. Um, and you see a lot of that activity now. Uh, in terms of in terms of relationships, um, it, and, and and so the control person in me says, "How are we going to pass the laws to get this under control? Because we can't allow this to happen." And the other side says, "How do we just get people to evaluate what it is that they're reading, reading, so that there is room for all this text, but we understand it within the appropriate context?" Right. Well, and you can take a look at it. Well, to answer one question, I think Canada actually did pass a law that made it uh, illegal for these these types of websites to to, to come through. Uh, although, you know, uh, how you how you really regulate the internet is, is <laughs> yeah. ridiculous. They can't cross the Canadian border, right? <laughs> which you know, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but my emphasis, if you're if you're asking me that, my emphasis is on the other part of what you said. How do we get people to really learn to evaluate information? Well, and I think that's the only th only that's the way that we can deal with it, and it's uh, in that. Intellectually, that's the only appropriate way to deal with it. But the laws never work anyway, and I mean that's silliness. Well, so laws don't regulate morality; they just regulate, you know, 
they're just laws and people have to make the choices that they do so uh, and that's the thing we have to but that's part of but that's also in, in that's caught up in the part of the study of rhetoric itself how do you make appropriate uh, choices concerning arguments and statements and even your own belief systems how do you evaluate yourself and what you believe in connection with uh, you know a value your value as opposed to a community value something larger something that either you hold as opposed to say something that's that's more observable outside of you um, so you have to make those negotiations and that's the thing that we what, what I would like to emphasize you know. well and as, as we get begin to understand this as a field right. and those of you that are experts in it begin to structure this thing in some way it seems to me that this becomes critical in our educational system down in the um, even later elementary but but middle schools and clearly high school that oh, how absolutely. much time should be dedicated in English courses to understanding what it is that you're reading on the internet and how do you evaluate it on the internet so that you understand the context and where it's come from how do you find this information so that you know how to evaluate it I mean it's it, it, you know it's interesting you say that because my, my sons go to a, a middle school in, in Orlando and they actually have a media program where they, they actually teach the, the students about the media uh, they do for instance a little television production and then they, you know, they do some. They do computer media. They teach them how to use the media. They mm -hmm. don't go into the real theoretical aspects that sure. we're talking about. But they, they, they at least expose them to the media and how it works. Okay, and that does, in some ways, give them a little bit of an insight of what's necessary in order to construct these images and these messages. Um, and in some ways, that's in terms of, of of lower educational level. I think that's about the best that you can do. Sure. Um, but sure. at some point... Because they're not abstract no. ability to do a clear abstract thinking at this point. It's just but by the time we get them in, into high school, how much time should we spend on Hamlet? And how much time should we spend with them saying, how do you evaluate what it is that you are reading every day inside these chat rooms and uh, in the other searches that they're doing every day? I mean, I mean the well, go automatic... Google click. Yeah. <laughs> well, one one way to do that might be to let them explore and and research and examine it for themselves in in some kind of structured way. I mean, teach them maybe more critical research skills so that they can then make those types of evaluations. I don't know. I'm not really a, a, a you know. A, a, well, I, I mean, I taught high school for a year, but that I don't think I'm an expert in, in, in you know childhood and, and adolescent education. So. But it seems to me, if that's a critical question, and you're right, it seems to me that what we need to do is to try and emphasize some kind of critical thinking skill along with that. So instead of just merely getting them to read Hamlet, maybe getting them to ask other co con questions concerning context of Hamlet that then they can also apply to looking at other mediums as well. Um, I had a thought and kind of went. But th that's in some ways where I think that, that maybe that's the start. Because by the time we get them in terms of college, uh, that's personally that's one of the things I try and do with them. I try and get them to actually critique uh, the the web, and I give them a series of, of tasks. For instance, to go look up stuff on the on the internet and tell me how much real information they were able to find. And what's interesting is that every semester that I've done this with the the, the very incoming freshmen, the the Comp One students, they come in with the expectation, oh yeah, the net's a good place. Once I do this. They do learn that they have to be careful. It's not that they completely mistrust the internet sure. anymore, but they realize then, oh, wait a minute, you know, I couldn't find this type of information really. I couldn't answer this question there. I couldn't find the source, for instance, of the author of this website. I couldn't find, you know, who, who supported the website, you know, that kind of thing. Um, those are the kind of critical research skills I think that we need to start giving students earlier than college that kind of thing. Ask them, okay, well, you go to this website, who hosts the website? Can you find that out? Who's actually written this? Um, is this website affiliated with a university, a medical institution, some kind of a, a you know, research facility, or is it old uh, Joe's website out of his out of his uh, out of his trailer, uh, or his home, something along those lines? Making those differentiations and getting to see the difference between, you know, this is something published from a university or or established system as opposed to this is something sure. that somebody just merely made up. Asking to make those kinds of evaluations, I think that's that's a skill that we need to give them a little bit earlier, and that's not something that I see being taught universally at say 
say the high school level. Well, and I wouldn't expect at this point it would be. Right. Because we're dealing in such a new field, such an emerging field in terms of the, the theories that you're developing. Yeah. It's a very, the explosion of the, of the internet. I mean, I was one of those people with great foresight that 10 years ago said, what a waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this will never go anywhere, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, that's true, but you can look at it also. What's interesting about what you just said is the same argument that's also been raised, for instance, in terms of mass media in general, say television and uh, radio, um, that what we have is we've had this mass media for a while now that has invaded our lives. Now, I don't necessarily think that it, in, in terms of pejoratively, but you know, it surrounds us, it's everywhere, it gives us our information, and how do we do that? And, um, and in certain ways creates our culture. Exactly. And there again, that's McLuhan all the way back in, 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 the, in the late 50s and the 60s writing about the advent of this new media that's, that's, that's changing the way we look at things. Um, and in some ways we've just already caught up to giving media instruction in school as well. Uh, taking a look at how television actually uh, creates the images or how it gets its, its information, how it constructs the information rhetorically. All of that has to do again with, with, with the rhetoric, rhetoric of media as well. So um, we're just catching up with that. It's clearly going to take a while to really catch up with taking a look at the digital environment and how that's, how that's then becoming uh, proliferate in our society as well. Um, these are, and the thing then again, if you're, if you're talking about, quote, my field, these are the questions that we have. There are no answers. Uh, there's nowhere in there that there's a definitive answer that we can come to. All at this point we have are questions that we're grasping at, uh, trying to relate them in some way that we can understand them so that we can apply it, uh, so that we can you know, understand, interpret, and even in some ways create the standards that may be necessary for information. Mm. So, what about you? <laughs> <laughs> what about me what? <laughs> no, um, let's talk about your field. I'm more interested in actually in that uh, at this point in time. Um, you work in the program that deals with the racing performance, right? Yeah, they, UCF has a very small motorsports program. We're the only university that offers a master's degree in high performance engine development, and it specifically is for racing. Um, I get, get phone calls, uh, and, and one of the first questions I ask them is, do you want to learn automotive engineering, or do you want to go racing? Right. And if you want to go racing, we'll keep talking. If you want to learn automotive engineering, uh, University of Michigan is a great place. Right. Virginia Tech, uh, Milwaukee, those are great places. They have great programs. Uh, let me recommend you, you can call these people. Right. If you want to go racing, if you specifically are interested in that, then let's talk about coming into the program and learning about how to develop high performance engines. And it's not a technology. It's a based program. It's an engineering based program because the we have come so far in the development of the uh, of high performance engines that it's no longer about that inspiration in the middle of the night. If we just tweak this one part, we'll win the race the next day. It isn't going to happen that way. What's going to happen is this very deliberate development, step by step and finding one more horsepower, two more horsepower, three more horsepower on it. Um, if you look at NASCAR, uh, they're going to be racing here at Daytona in just a couple of weeks, the 4th of July race. The difference in horsepower between the worst car that is having trouble making the field or may not make the field and the person that's going to sit on the pole will be 10 horsepower. I mean, that's that's insignificant. Yeah. That's a fraction of a percent difference between them, and that's between best and worst. And so in this program, we st study advanced statistical methods so that you can eke out the most amount of information from the data that you collect when you're trying to develop these engines. Well, that's pretty neat. Um, do you find then that, well, Okay, what kind of methods do you use then in order to do that? I mean, what are some of the, the measurements and some of the ways that you are able to, to get that kind of a, um, analysis done? Well, it, it, the, the, the general field is called design of experiments. Okay. And uh, uh, there are different techniques that you can use all the way from 
neural net kind of things that may fit under that and genetic algorithms and but basically it's examining things at the extreme so we know this isn't going to work but we're going to test it so that we get some data over here and then we're going to test some something on this other extreme and then we're going to test some things in between and then mathematically we're going to start fitting curves in between and say okay we went from here to here and the optimum is someplace in between and if we can get a good mathematical fit to these curves on it we can find the peak of the mountain even though we were never there the old method always was uh, the blind man climbing up the mountain we try something then we try something else and if it's better well we're going in the right direction keep doing what you're doing and keep going in that direction until it gets worse and then you say okay I'm at the peak of the mountain well you may not get the peak of the mountain you just went up to this peak that's only a little way up the mountain and there's this little dip right there and then it starts going up again and you never never know where that summit is right. and this method done correctly allows you to avoid getting stuck at that intermediate peak and allows you to keep looking for for the top the problem with it is that there are so many variables that we can deal with that we can't design an experiment that takes them all into account all at once to find the true global optimum right. and so we design experiments we're going to work on this little part of the engine system and we're going to find the optimum for that and now that we have found the optimum for that we'll go work on another part of the engine but as soon as we work on the other part of the engine the optimum we found over here may not be optimum anymore so we don't end up working ourselves out of out of business we just keep finding this gets a little better this gets a little better this gets a little better and we are climbing up this up this mountain um, 12 years ago we were making 650 horsepower and today we're making 850 horsepower we're climbing up the mountain and I don't know where the peak is right. I just know we've gotten to 850 and maybe the peak is at 875 or 900 or a thousand I don't know where it is anymore and I don't even speculate I just know that we go into the lab and we struggle and we find one more and it's that one more plus the one more plus the one more that keeps us going up this mountain right uh, it's interesting if you ever get to a peak is there then another criteria that then changes what that next peak oh, will yeah, be? Yeah, sure. I mean, because our objective as, as engineers are to make the, is to make the most power we possibly can, and the rulemaking bodies are to make as many rules as they possibly can to keep us all equal. And our, our job to make sure that we're not equal, that we're the best. Right. <laughs> and so, so if we find a breakthrough it will only take them a very short period to make a rule that makes our breakthrough not a breakthrough anymore either the technology disperses and everybody has it right. and so then we've all climbed up the mountain but we're all equal again which is what they want on it or they outlaw it <laughs> 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 yeah that's really great but you can't do that anymore it's and so then you quietly go off and start looking in another area to find mm -hmm. something else what, what what gets something outlawed? I mean, that'd be pretty interesting. I mean, what are the the reasons why, like, pushing the engine <laughs> to that particular level is not acceptable? Or, or they, I can't answer that question. I mean, that's that the the rulemaking bodies make rules because they can, and their objective, as I said, is to keep everybody the same. And so, uh, they make rules that think that they're going to do that, and that's. They'll often, however, use the excuse that it's their job to make sure that the cost of racing doesn't become too high. Okay. Um, a good friend of mine, Don Miller, he's president of Penske Racing, which is one of the premier racing organizations okay. world worldwide. Don said he would he would be a multimillionaire if they would just stop trying to save him money <laughs> 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 because every time they outlaw something on it. They make it that much harder for us to find any more horsepower so more money gets invested trying to find more horsepower than what it would have if they hadn't made the rule in the first place right. so it's it's an ongoing thing it's the game between us and them to make to to get our car up front and and win the race do, do you find that um, 
Is your program, is it really that industry specific? Do you have particular companies, corporations, or, or um, entities looking at, at your program and trying to shape it, or, or, or are you in some way shaping and innovating the field in, in the, that they're working in? I think we're more shaping and innovating the, f the field in terms of the education and, the, and what we should be teaching and what these people need to know when they go out. Um, we've had some meetings with a, a very top people in the, in the field as a board of advisors. And I said, so here's the curriculum, what should we be doing? And they said, I don't know, but whatever you're doing, keep doing it because your people are exactly what we need. And so we have to, we're really innovating and sending people out and then listening carefully how they're succeeding and watching how their careers are going mm -hmm. on it to see how we should modify a course or change completely change a course, add something, drop something from the from the program so that we stay on the on the cutting edge as a as a program. Okay. Um, in terms of that, there's something I thought was interesting. Uh, we were talking earlier. Um, you had mentioned, in some ways, some of the the barriers that the technology provides in, in certain areas. Say, um, I think we were talking specifically about um, fuel uh, and hydrogen fuel and that thing. But Al alternative fuels. Alternative fuels. Uh, but what are some of the barriers in terms of the technology that you see? You know, just in in in, in the the program that you're working with right there. What are some of the technologies that actually uh, keep that, that, that from going to that other peak that you're thinking of or that you're trying to get to? Well, we're working with a heat engine. And so it's trying to make certain that every little bit of heat that you generate becomes useful heat in turning the crankshaft and making horsepower instead of going somewhere else going into the radiator as waste heat or coming out the exhaust as, as waste heat or uh, going into the oil as waste heat. You're trying to capture all of that because whatever heat we can. And so one of the areas that we're looking at right now is some ceramic coatings that we can put inside the engine to trap that heat and to then thereby better utilize it. So we're putting it on the top of pistons, on the crown of the piston, and in the combustion chambers inside the engine itself. And people have messed with ceramic coatings before, but the problem is that the things expand and contract so much, the cer and the ceramics are so hard that they crack and chip off. And mm -hmm. when you get pieces of ceramic bouncing around inside of an engine doing 9,000 RPM, nothing yes. good happens nothing anymore. Good yeah, re in fact, really bad things usually happen. But, but NASA developed a technology to bond ceramics in a whole different way. And they're using it in their rocket engines that has made a tremendous difference in the life of, of a rocket engine. Um, and so we're experimenting with that now. Can we, do we now have a technology that we can apply in an internal combustion engine and uh, thereby keep that heat into the, in the cylinder and get a little bit more useful work out of it instead of having it be waste heat going out of, out of the engine. So that, that's one of the areas that we're doing. So we're, we're off on those cutting edges a lot of times. And, and, the, and the conflicts that we run into is that the teams that we work for Understand that's what we do, and I tell them, you know, you have to take a long-term view. Universities are thinking in terms of of centuries, you know. <laughs> Every, we think in terms of of multiple decades, and they're going, yeah, but I've got a race on Saturday or Sunday. Right. Do you have any more horsepower for me? Well, no, it's Wednesday. I can't give you anything more by Sunday. <laughs> well, what about the next week? Will it be ready then? Well, probably not. You know, uh, three semesters from now, we might have an inkling that it's going to work. <laughs> you know, that's an, interesting, that's an interesting question about the nature of um, discipline and study, uh, where, as you just said, you're looking, looking to, you know, ahead in the decades or, or in a future to see how far this will actually work as opposed to, a here and now practicality. Um, how much of, the, of a conflict is that really in terms of in terms of what you do? In terms of racing, it's huge. Right. It's huge. Um, I think 
a lot of industry is runs month to month, quarter to quarter. The mm -hmm. bottom line has to be there. Their stock has to be the profits to be there to support their stock and so forth. But even in that kind of environment, most large companies have a research division that may not be purely theoretical, but they're willing to look some years out because they understand that they need to develop technologies today that are going to drive technologies into the future. And But race teams can't do that right. um, because they're funded for this year, and they may not be funded next year, and they've got a race to win this week or next week. And, and so there really is a difficult relationship that we walk all the time with these race teams between what it is that we think is really important to drive the technology forward and their need to have something immediate, the immediate gratification to win that race and so that they can get refunded for next year. Right. So, <laughs> you know, so, and, and I don't know, I haven't, I haven't figured out how we, how we solve that problem. Right. And, and, it, and the conflict for us is within the, within the university structure, it's important to have research funds. Those research funds support the yeah, graduate students, they support the equipment, they support the program. The I mean, it, 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 the dollars, the research dollars drive the program. And a lot of research dollars within the university are government dollars because, because the federal government or state government, uh, different divisions uh, of it, can take that longer term view and they're willing to take that longer t term view on it. So that's where the research dollars come from. Right. We have not found any part of the federal government that's interested in racing engines. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've it's not a real demand for them, huh? They're, <laughs> so. they're just not really interested in the checker flag. So it tends to then be industry driven more than It's likely. industry driven and the industry itself is so immediate that we struggle with, with getting significant research dollars into the program. Um,